Here we go, and attendees are coming in. If you look at the box on the right, uh, um, panelists, you'll get an idea of all the attendees that are coming through. Mm -hmm. And for everybody who is joining the webinar, welcome. And thank you for purchasing your tickets to the second in the series of the Fashion Network Professional Development uh, webinars. Uh, today's webinar is a buying and, merchandise, buying and merchandising workshop. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel. Uh, lined up um, and we'll be going through uh, several discussion points. If you do have any questions uh, or comments, you can leave it in the chat box. Um, our chairperson today is Lisa Trencher from Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, she will do her best to try and answer as many of your questions. If we can't do it, then we apologise because we've only got an hour, um, but uh, we will do our best. Uh, so feel free to pop your questions or comments in the chat box. Um, Lisa will chair the event and shortly she'll introduce all the speakers or the speakers will introduce themselves uh, and then around about three o'clock we'll close uh, and there'll be an email on the screen from the Fashion Network so if you've got any further questions comments or feedback we'd be grateful for that so without further ado um, I will now hand over to Lisa Trencher who's chairing the discussion today so Lisa over to you. Hi, thanks, Dale. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Really great that you can all be here. And I think we've got a couple of friends from the US, so you're very welcome as well. And um, so let's get started. First of all, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. So if we start with Fiona from um, Public Desire. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, so I am currently head of buying and design for Public Desire, which are a fashion footwear brand based in Manchester. Um, prior to this, I was living in London for seven years where I was senior footwear buyer for ASOS. Um, and also I was working in Primark um, for five years, um, also a senior footwear buyer and accessories. Hi, okay, so <laughs> over to Chloe on the merchandising side. Hi, so I'm Chloe. I'm um, a senior merchandiser at M Brown. I also like Fiona working footwear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very footwear heavy panel today. Um, but I have worked in menswear in the past, um, in brands as well, and also in camping equipment. So um, a little bit of variety there. I've worked in merchandising for about nine years now. Um, when I first started my career, I moved down to London. Um, but I actually graduated in economics, so not really anything to do with fashion. But yeah, moved straight into that and then... Here I am nine years later. So yeah, that's kind of my backstory. Thanks, Chloe. So then we'll move on to Grace, who's the Retail Strategy Director for Edited. Hi, Grace. Hey, everybody. Hi, um, I'm Grace. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, um, I'm the EMEA Regional uh, Retail Strategy Director Edited. Um, so I've been at Edited for nearly four years, but like the other ladies, um, my background was in buying and merchandising previously. So I actually used Edited in my previous role which was in the US. I was working at Abercrombie & Fitch, working on that brand, but also Hollister, uh, where I managed the girls' bottoms business. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Edited, um, we're the global leader in mar uh, retail market intelligence. So my role um, is focused on helping retailers um, drive sales and improve margin by making better decisions with reliable AI-driven data. Um, so have a great job working with kind of leading retailers like Zara, Boohoo, um, and Tommy Hilfiger to leverage our data and, and kind of make better decisions and drive better outcomes. So really excited to join everyone today. Thanks, Grace. And over to Tessa, who's in talent Acqu acquisition for M Brown. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tessa. So I'm um, head of talent acquisition at the N Brown Group. So I work with Chloe. Um, I actually, funnily enough, started off my career in buying. So. Um, after graduating at university, I decided to go down the, um, the sort of the buying career route. So I went to London College of Fashion and graduated and um, started my career in buying down in London um, for just under six years. Um, but then I made a bit of a career, a career change and moved into um, recruitment, which I've been doing now for five years. Um, and I worked with recruitment within buying and merchandising in London. And then I moved to Manchester, which is an amazing city. And I have now work for the M Brown Group as Head of Talent Acquisition. Thanks, everybody. So that's great. So that's your panel for the webinar today. 
So let's just uh, kick straight off and think about um, the role of the buyer and the role of the merchandiser. So Fiona, if you we talk to you about uh, the buying side, first of all, and your day-to-day -day responsibilities. Yeah, sure, no problem. So um, I would say the biggest difference between buying and merch, I guess, looking, both roles are of equal importance, I think is the first thing to say. And it's a crucial relationship that you have um, as a buyer with your merchandiser. Um, both roles need to function and perform equally well in order for a company to maximize sales. Um, my role is primarily product focused and I would say that's probably the biggest difference. Um, so depending if you're a branded buyer or a development buyer, I work with designers and suppliers um, every day, basically building and creating ranges based on what I think will appeal to the customer. Um, so I negotiate prices. Um, and building relationships with the suppliers is a huge part of my job. Um, I also look and study trends um, every day. It's crucial to what I do to determine what's going to be the next big thing um, in the coming season. Also, what's downtrending. So I come together with a plan in terms of all of this product and I present that to my merchandiser, keep them informed in terms of what I think is going to be the next big thing, what I'm forecasting, and they structure the financial plan around the info that I've provided them with and what kind of my good feel is for the season. Um, so I work with my merchandiser to decide on budgets um, to plan the ranges in terms of the quantities and the intakes of the collection. Um, I would say it's crucial as a buyer that you understand the merchandising role um, and vice versa that the buyer or that the merchandiser understands the product role because you can have the best product in the world but if the numbers aren't right you know you're not going to achieve your target so they're, they're of equal importance for sure. So Chloe in terms of merchandising? Yeah so I'd say a lot of what Fiona just said basically like the relationship between buying and merch, I think over the past years has definitely grown. I think merch was kind of like a bit of a function that in some businesses hasn't um, got, had its kind of like priority. But I think over the past few years, have definitely grown alongside each other. And I think not a day goes by that you don't really speak to your buyer. And um, so I think that that relationship is absolutely crucial. A lot of what Fiona said, so um, there's definitely the, the product side of it in terms of like making sure that the financials are there in terms of that kind of like that planning point of view so have we got the product landed at the right time and um, have we got enough of it coming in have we, have we bought enough um have in terms of the risks have we made sure we've kind of quantified those and talked them through and make sure we're happy with those and then kind of signing that off with the financials in terms of what our budgets are i think to layer on top of that from a merchandising point of view there's a, a stock management piece which is kind of like where fiona's talking to the suppliers and building that relationship in terms of a costing point of view a sampling point of view we're doing it from a stock management point of view so when is that stock landing and um, has it been sealed um, has it been fit has it been approved aesthetically is it ready to ship and once it has shipped when is it coming into us um, there's that side of it there's also kind of like the promotional side of it as well so and, and the trading side so once that product's in if it's performing well brilliant what are we doing about it are we are we telling the buying team that they need to go and buy another colorway or um do we need to kind of bring something forward that's similar to it or on the opposite side if it's not doing so well what have we bought that's similar to that how can we trade out of it um and then there's also a side where we're kind of like communicating from a marketing point of view in terms of what's coming in what are the big kind of trends for us and that, that's working alongside with the buying team as well in terms of by month what are our big shout outs and what do you do, what do we want you to go out and push so i'd say there's a couple of different elements to on the buying side but they, they all kind of overlap and obviously between you you're covering off quite a lot of trading periods at one time by the sounds of things <laughs> as well yeah okay so in grace in terms of how the industry's changing and sort of where uh, you know, technology such as edited and things come in. How, how have you seen that developing over the years? Yes, I mean, 2020 has been a wild year and an anomaly um, <laughs> in itself. Um, but I guess there's kind of three key things that I wanted to touch on, which was firstly being kind of the acceleration of e-commerce. Um, so obviously there's been explosive growth in this field, um, a lot of that fueled by COVID. Um, so there's an amazing stat, which is that in 2020, um, the rate of growth 
of e-commerce um, would have previously taken 40 years for us to reach that point. Um, so, you know, and I think it's really highlighted the importance of an omni-channel approach for retailers. So, you know, Primark is a classic example of being a brick and mortar uh, business. Uh, you know, their revenues were around 650 million pounds a month. Um, so, you know, in lockdowns that went from 650 million to zero pounds with no e-commerce presence. Um, so, you know, we're seeing huge growth uh, in, in e-commerce. You know, it's projected to be around $4.2 trillion in, in sales. Um, so again, this is just highlighting um, the importance of, of an omni-channel approach. I think as well, the competitiveness of the industry uh, is really important to touch on. Um, you know, the strong are only getting stronger. And I know that there's been lots of news in, um, there's been a lot of retailers in the news in the past week at least, um, and just showing how cutthroat the industry really is. Um, you know, and ultimately, you know, touching on what Chloe and Fiona have just spoken to, you know, roles as buying and merchandising is is fundamentally kind of about getting the basics of economics correct you know the um, supply matches demand um, and making sure that you're getting top performers to market really understanding trend that you've got an assortment that really connects with your consumer um, but this has become even more difficult um, when trends are transseasonal so previously you would have had kind of segmented seasons within the year but I know you know as we know like ASOS drop over 4,000 products a week you know, for a buyer and a merchandiser to keep on track of what's going on in the industry is is ever more difficult. Um, so kind of monitoring competitors and, and what's happening out there um, and how do you do that effectively and accurately um, has really spoken to the importance of, of, of data and using tools there. Um, and then ultimately kind of the impact of COVID as well. Um, so I know that obviously a lot of retailers have had to be creative in the past year in, in how they're kind of creating that shopping experience. So there's been a lot of changes um, that we've seen. So there's a, a company called um, Obsess that do creative kind of virtual store platforms and they saw kind of inbounds and in, uh, interest in their platform increase by over 300% um, since the start of lockdown. So traditional methods of working together have definitely changed and been forced to change as well within the industry i'm sure you know as we're kind of working from home it's very different to how buyers and merchandisers would have previously worked together and collaborated um you know buyers can't necessarily go on comp shopping trips into stores when stores are closed or or travel and go on you know inspirational um shopping trips so really having to rely on you know, online and all the different tools that are out there. Um, so, yeah, I think kind of leveraging that data is, has definitely been essential um, in, in the past year and how I'm seeing the industry change. But really interesting figures there, um, Grace, quite eye-watering really, aren't they? And um, just a question from um, one of the um, delegates, has the increase of e-com growth been across the board or predominantly the bigger retailers? So have the smaller brands also seen growth in this? Yes, we've seen it across the board, across all retailers. Um, but again, I think it's highlighted the importance of, of all brands and uh, of different sizes investing or looking at different channels as well. So whether that's exploring opportunities of working with different partners um, from a wholesale perspective or, or using marketplace um, methods and tactics. Great. And we just got another question which relates to um, buying roles. So what we'll do is save that question. We'll ask Tessa at the end. Um, I guess, uh, Fiona, in terms of the technology then, things like edited and, and, and those kinds of um, technological advances that are coming through, how does that impact um, the job role in terms of the buying function? Um, hugely so. I mean, the shift to digital trading has had a massive impact on how we buy compared to how we used to buy. Um, constant connectivity means like a huge demand for constant newness from, from customers because they're constantly on the phone seeing new things. So it used to be that you bought like maybe eight, every eight weeks, let's say you bought in bulk and then you went, you signed it off and you, you know, you came back then eight weeks later and did the same thing again. You were building your range, but now it's like 
we need constant newness and speed to market is crucial. So buying happens like throughout the whole season now and it's not so um, structured as what it used to be because it just needs to be that way. There needs to be that flexibility. Um, also where, I mean, outside of COVID, the need to travel and buy samples um, for inspiration is a lot less than what it used to be because of the access to information online. And just the fact that we can see everything online when Fashion Week happens and the collections are shown, we literally can see it live. So um, the need to travel is definitely less. Um, in terms of obviously the explosion of Instagram, social media, TikTok um, devices in general mean that we the trends can blow up super, super quickly. Um, so again, that just means speed to market becomes increasingly important. Um, I mean, we get requests from celebrity stylists all the time. Um, so if we have a piece, for example, and somebody like Beyonce or Kylie Jenner wears something, um, you know, all of a sudden you've got this huge demand for something that could be incredibly difficult, A, to predict and B, to keep up with it. Um, so you really can't forecast for this kind of this this kind of change, and also the fact that influencers play such a huge um, and crucial important part in how we market. Again, very difficult to predict. If an influencer wears something, again, it can it can explode. You may not have enough stock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in addition to that, I think the fact that um, obviously when you're on a digital platform you are um, more often than not are shipping globally. Whereas before, we, you know, you might've been buying for, let's say 150 stores that were all based in the UK. All of a sudden you've got to factor in the needs for customers in different markets. Um, and also, I guess the different requirements in terms of legalities and testing and copyright law, because obviously everything is much more exposed um, when you're online. Um, I would say also from a buying perspective, um, like when you were buying for a group of stores before there was e-com, I guess you kind of could exist in your own silo where your job and, you know, started and ended with getting the product right. But now so much hinges on how it's produced in terms of the photography, you know, how it's marketed. So it's just crucial that you have really strong relationships um, with all of the teams um, to, to ensure that your product is, you know, shown in the best light um, and also that you get the coverage that you need on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that was a huge eye opener for me, just the importance of marketing um, when you're when you're like pure play, when you're only e-commerce, because you're just so reliant on um, your website being pushed as opposed to, let's say, you know, people just walking into the store because they're on the high street. So you don't really have a shop window to the same degree as what you used to. So you're relying on platforms like Instagram. Um, Fiona, sorry, uh, there's a question for Fiona. With the advancement of digital showrooms, 360 fitting rooms, virtual appointments, do you think the industry will bounce back to traditional face-to-face -face appointments? Do you think we'll go back there? Um, no, I think, to be honest, I think I would say that it will definitely be less so. I think people have adjusted to the fact now that they are buying offline sheets from a wholesale perspective. And I think, you know, companies that are savvy are gonna to react to that and think like it's less of a spend for us. It's gonna keep our travel budgets down. People don't necessarily need to travel abroad now to actually have these appointments. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely that's something that is here to stay. Okay, thanks. That was a good question from Lorianne, actually. So, Chloe, in terms of platforms like Edited and things, how does that help you in, in your day-to-day -day job? Well, I guess, like, with COVID, what we kind of, like, obviously, from a merchandising point of view, we are all about planning and forward thinking and what's coming up. And with COVID hitting, that kind of threw everything up in the air. Like, we didn't know what our customer wanted to buy anymore. We didn't know what events she'd be going to or like what occasions she was shopping for. So it was a real pivot in terms of like what people wanted. Like people weren't going to the offices anymore. People, so dresses, work shoes, that kind of thing, demand for that kind of like would just fall away. However, loungewear, pajamas kind of just skyrocketed. So that's where we kind of got our, our best guesses kind of thing in terms of what was happening within the market, kind of where were trends building. Um, like Grace said, it just really allows you to put a bit of confidence behind, um, I guess, your gut feel or what's going on. I think 
one thing that is super important from a buy-in perspective and, and somewhat merch as well is having that gut feel in terms of um, what you think the next big thing will be or like your trend forecast. And then I think tools like Edited really give you a bit of confidence to go after that. So that's definitely something that we used in terms of helping to pivot what we were moving more towards and what we were moving away from. And I think it's definitely something that we will continue to use. I think another good point that Grace made as well was with the amount of newness dropping down by um, each online retailer, like for example, M Brown is, is purely digital. We are, we, we play in that realm and our um, website is our storefront. And, you know, there is that increase in, um, that kind of increase in demand for newness and how you keep on top of that. It's just so much to keep on top of. So those tools really help you see kind of what, your competitors are going after or kind of like what the latest trends are and then you can kind of use that into your strategies because as Fiona kind of said we, we I guess what we used to do is we used to plan very far in advance and don't get me wrong we still do that but we're constantly now adapting that plan to change in terms of if things need to be shifted about and I think tools like Edited and, and other ones in the market help you direct what that change needs to be. Great. We've got some really couple of really good questions on sustainability. So we're going to come back to sustainability and have a little bit more of a discussion with it in a little while. Um, the next thing we thought we would uh, would be useful for you to, to understand from the webinar would be core skills in terms of buying and merchandise. And so Fiona, if we start with you in terms of what you feel the core skills are for needed for career in buying. I would say definitely you need, if you want to work as a development buyer, you need to be creative. Um, you definitely need to be very, very analytical. Um, I think being confident and having good presentation skills, and these aren't, you know, these are, a lot of these skills are skills that you learn on the job. You don't necessarily start off this way, but as uh, you know, as you, as you go through your career, um, commercial awareness is another thing that's really, really crucial to understand what's going in the market, how the customer reacts to certain products. Um, I would say one that's really, really important is to be thick skinned as well, because, you know, um, it's not the easiest job in the world. It's hugely rewarding. Um, but, you know, you, you can't take things personally because you make so many decisions every day. And, you know, quite often your products, products that you develop end up being like when you see something from start to finish, when you come up with an idea and then, you know, all of a sudden it becomes an actual product and then, you know, maybe somebody doesn't like it or your, your buying director or your head of buying doesn't agree with your choice, you, you just can't take it personally because at the end of the day, it's all, you know, everyone is trying to predict what's going to happen in the market. Um, I'd say another thing that's really important is to, to have tenacity to say, you know, you're not going to give up because again, there's a lot of ups and downs, um, but, you know, it's a hugely rewarding job. Um, I absolutely love it. I've, I've loved it my whole career. I've made a huge amount of friends um, through through buying and I think you know just just don't give up stick stick with it because it's it's a fantastic career Ab. so Chloe in the merch corner what, <laughs> what core skills do you think are needed for first be a successful merchandiser so there's a lot of what Fiona just touched on as well so I guess it's kind of split it into two so there's like the attitude side of it and then the actual like ability side of it so from an attitude point of view, absolutely thick skinned and kind of just like resilient, like Fiona just mentioned, there are decisions that you've made that will not work. <laughs> they just won't. And I think at that point, it's kind of having that like resilience and honesty to be like, didn't work. What are we doing about it? It's not about it didn't work and we'll just leave it. You need to be action focused. You need to just kind of like pick yourself up and carry on to so definitely that kind of like outlook and I think can-do attitude and positivity is one of the most important things. I think, especially in retail at the moment, it, it is tough. It's really tough. Um, and I think just having that positivity and that positive spin on, on outlook and in terms of what you bring to work, I think that's one of the things that can, can really elevate you. And especially like Tessa will probably touch on that later when we get on to kind of like a recruitment side. It's so refreshing when you see that attitude in people. Um, and I think one thing from a merch side as well is be curious. Um, just in terms of there's so much going on and, and you really need that drive to kind of be thinking, that looks a bit strange or that's interesting. I'm going to dig a bit deeper into that. So I think that's definitely something on merch and possibly on buying as well that I think you need. Um, in terms of ability from merch side, I'd say definitely numerical. You don't need a maths degree, but you definitely need to be okay with numbers. 
um, ability to kind of like be, um, to spot patterns, kind of that analytical mindset and just relationship building as well, like being able to phone someone, build a relationship with someone. Um, we're all working remotely, so you can't have that face-to-face -face interaction like you once did. So that ability to kind of like build relationships online is really, really important, I, I feel. Great. There's, there's a, good, a couple of good questions actually asking around in terms of volume now. So we've all been on lockdown, COVID, and we've all managed with what we've got. Do you think you'll see a change in demand for products in terms of what people are looking for? And maybe Grace, you've got a bit of insight here as well in terms of post-COVID consumption. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think, you know, obviously, um, 2020 has obviously enabled consumers to kind of sit back and and really think about uh, think about what it is that they're buying and, and 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 buying less so I think you know consumer demand around sustainable fashion and and kind of demand have you know have only increased during the pandemic um so, you know, I think McKinsey did a report in July this year where it said, you know, kind of 60% of all of their respondents said that they're going to be you know, more considerate in what they purchase and, and looking for um, different alternatives, um, you know, and, and buying less. You know, there's been an explosion of, of different businesses as well that really focus on reuse, repair, rent, um, things like that. So, there's definitely a, a huge industry um, that has grown off the back of not just wanting to buy new things and want newness, but um, being more considered um, in how you consume fashion. Great. OK, so in terms of um, sort of, you know, how these tools are used, so, so something like edited WGSN, in terms of how they're used to do the job, we've touched on it with Chloe, but what what? How do, you, how do you work on a day-to-day -day basis with industry to help them to sort of use these tools for to make the businesses more efficient, more profitable and focused? Yeah, definitely. So obviously, you know, AI and, and data is really there to help retailers and brands spot opportunity and also to spot risk within their assortment. So, you know, whilst internal sales data is amazing and really useful, you know, it's kind of only half of the story. Um, so using that market intelligence is really going to help you and is, is critical um, to kind of surviving in the new retail climate. You know, one thing in terms of core skills that, you know, Fiona and Chloe were speaking to, um, one thing is really important to kind of challenge historic concepts as well and you know not just have the ceiling of oh this is what we did last year so this is how we're going to plan our assortment for next year it's looking at uh, new concepts and new ways to drive your business but I think in terms of comp shopping that's a really important exercise um, to benchmark mark yourself understand what the competitors are doing you know what are they bringing in what newness are they dropping each week um what is the assortment mix how is pricing changing over time and with edited we're able to do that at scale so typically you know in businesses you know BAAs or MAAs may be responsible for doing those comp shops and we all know that that takes a lot of time um, to go to stores take photos you know record it all in a spreadsheet and then present that back to directors or to your buyers in um, you know trade or in a meeting the following week but by the time you've done that, that data is all out of date because if it's somebody like ASOS, they've already dropped 4,000 more products uh, or, you know, Topshop, for example. So what Edited helps you do is we're able to track, we track over 90,000 brands and we're able to do uh, what we do in 24 hours. It would take a retail professional working five days a week, uh, eight hours a day, 18 years. Um, so it's just really the power of having that scale of data to be able to spot those gaps and opportunities. 
But again, not only is it looking at it on a weekly basis and understanding what's dropping, what's changing, but helping you forward plan and plan for season. So I know Chloe spoke to that as well. You know, seasonality is a huge thing, especially when you work in categories like swimwear or outerwear. You know, we know that there's been massive changes there. So, you know, as you know, when you're talking about global warming, is it that retailers are dropping out of later because it's not getting colder until later? So being able to use data to be able to pinpoint, pinpoint when your competitors are dropping products, not just in your home markets, but if you're looking at international expansion as well, how does that differ in Russia versus Brazil, for example? So um, there are amazing examples of how you can do it, how you can use the data to, to make you do your job better. Um, and, and one thing I want to also stress is sometimes it can be a bit threatening and scary to have this, this data and um, technology, but I think it's just leaning into it and embracing it. And it's, you know, there's, it's essential to have a buyer and a merchandiser and the skill and expertise that Fiona, Chloe and their teams have, but it's using the data to back up, back up that gut instinct and make more informed decisions because we know how you know the impact of dead stock and what that's having on the industry so as much as we can make more informed decisions and minimize that impact the better it's just uh, thanks thanks grace there's a, a good question um asking around so as a buyer and um, this may be somebody who's not used edited before where would you start with edited what would you what would you start in terms of how you use i know i know from uni that students do um training and things like that but where would you start as a buyer in industry how you know from using ed edited yeah I think obviously a fundamental um goal of a buyer is keeping on, on top of trend and understanding what is going on in the market so I think uh, the first place to start I would is just have um an analysis or a dashboard that's set up monitoring your competitors on a weekly basis and understanding what products they're dropping what categories um and what price points that they're really going after and you'll be able to instantly spot trends and see what attributes and styles they're they're really going after but also seeing what's selling out to Thanks. So Fiona, in terms of if we touch back on uh, trend forecasting, how else do you get um, how else do you get your trend forecasting information? Um, so I use the WGSN, which um, pretty much everybody involved in the fashion industry does. Um, and I use other websites as well, like the Impression, First View, um, Vogue. Um, I use the fashion feed on the WGSN, which is a new function, which is actually really beneficial. It's almost like an Instagram um, for trends that pop up on a daily basis. I would say um, for fashion forecasting, for what I do in terms of, because I work for a very kind of um, reactive brand, um, fashion month coverage is essential for me and my designer to keep on top of in terms of like fashion weeks. Um, so it's like we literally would be on watching the shows every day to see, you know, what the new trends are that are coming through, um, especially for key designers, um, because, you know, there are certain designers who can influence the trends and the colours and that will determine the direction for the entire season. Um, there's key influencers who I follow um, that give me a good indication of what is going to be next, like the next big thing. Um, and you kind of do, you start to see a pattern in terms of certain people wear certain things and then everything just kind of gradually trickles down um, also what, what the street style stars are wearing at fashion week is another really good indication for what's kind of what's coming on trend and unfortunately obviously with the whole situation with COVID that's kind of it's made it more difficult in terms of being able to see what people are wearing on the street um, but still like literally being glued to Instagram 24 seven is just part of being a fashion buyer um, and seeing what, you know, what, what, what's coming through, because a lot of it is not necessarily now it's, it may not be driven from the catwalk. The catwalk still plays a big part, but then, you know, like I said, big influencers can actually, you know, they can create trends themselves. Um, also, you know, there might just be key colors or prints that keep popping up. And I would say, even based on um, the current situation, the pandemic and everything that's happened within 2020, the, the market adopts and, you know, trends are quite often a reflection of what's happening around us, you know, socially and economically. So naturally, I think 
what's happening at the moment is it will have an ongoing effect and um yeah i think um wgsn is not the be all and end all although it is really really good, really beneficial i think instagram and other platforms you can um get a few huge amount out of for trend forecasting so there's quite a lot to inspire you there isn't there so chloe in terms of edited within a business like M Brown, is it used by buying and merchandising? And if so, how how different is that, or is it a collaborative thing? So we definitely both use it. I think we probably take a slightly different angle on how we use it. So from a buying perspective, much like Fiona covered, um, from a merch point of view, we use it from a planning perspective in terms of I think Grace mentioned it, like key price points that we might not have, or key price points that the market's bringing in. Um, we look at it from a phasing point of view as well. Um, we kind of look at what the market's dropping down and then we use either internal or Google data in terms of what people are searching. So for example, we find that our outerwear sales would pick up in say like October, November, but actually you start shopping for your winter coat in like September or like at least having a bit of a look around. So we start seeing when are we going to sell the product versus when is she maybe like searching for it. So that's where we kind of like married two things together. Um, the way that I would look at it and a lot of the merch function within M Brown is kind of discounting as well. So um, what have other competitors dropped, which have now gone straight into discount. So then we can start looking at our future assortment because for us, discounts kind of signaling it's dead stock or it's not quite work. So how can we pivot to make sure if we've got anything like that, how can we, we change and adapt that? Are on the opposite side if there's um, lines which are key sellouts and we, we've, we've bought something similar or, or we've kind of got onto that trend do we need to buy more do we need to kind of communicate with suppliers so I guess it's kind of like the more like once it's selling that's where we're using it rather than that pre-selling period there's the planning element of it but there's a lot for merch to do once it's in and it's selling and it helps us trade through. Great that's great. Um, Fiona, just a question, I guess, best, best for you, really. Just somebody's asking, Anna, um, how does the vintage fashion influence decision making and trend forecast? And do you, do you use it? Do you look at vintage pieces and things? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think when a lot of the time when you're trying to maybe come up with a new concept as well, when the market is so saturated with the same um, ideas and everybody copying the same brands, quite often it can be beneficial to maybe look at something from the past and combine that with something current to come up with a new idea, definitely. And um, Trinella is, um, is, has noted that you've all got very busy jobs. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have time to read the business of fashion and annual reports? And if so, how helpful is that to you? I love the business of fashion. It's, yeah, I absolutely, I, I find it really invaluable. Um, and then like, in addition to that, some of the other websites that I mentioned, Vogue.com is really helpful as well. And the impression, um, another one is subscription based, but also has really interesting, relevant um, articles. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can't do a buying and merchandising webinar without also looking at um, sustainability. So um, obviously uh, COVID has given us time to really reflect on where we are, but in terms of sustainability, Grace, perhaps you would answer this one. How are customer attitudes changing? What are you seeing from a forecasting point of view in terms of sustainable products, attitudes, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, 2019 was really the year of sustainability. Um, and I think what's really encouraging and really exciting is how far up sustainability is on um, so many fashion brands mission and and um and importance to them i think just looking even at like the inditex group for example and looking at the commitments that they're making um to sustainability and 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 using uh, recycled uh fabrics um and being more conscious of how they're manufacturing um i think again there were some big areas in which coronavirus has drawn attention to sustainability so whether that's kind of rethinking fashion weeks do there need to be as many fashion weeks and can they happen digitally do they require the um the air travel and the you know everybody flocking to a certain city um there's an amazing stat about how the uh carbon emissions of having all of the editors all of the models everyone travel to one city for fashion week how that could light up Times square for an entire year um so that's you know quite eye-opening um 
but again, just helping fast fashion slow down. So do we require about 4,000 products to drop every week from a certain brand? Um, again, like I spoke to earlier and like the stats on shifting consumer mindsets as well. Um, so 41% of all Gen Z said that global warming is the most important issue that is, is facing the world. Um, and, you know, again, 90% of those consumers also believe that those fashion brands have the responsibility to address sustainability. Um, but again, also 2020 has forced uh, consumers to really reconnect with nature and be outdoors more. You know, obviously we can't be going to bars and restaurants as we have previously. So people have been going out for walks and enjoying the outdoors. Um, so again, that's influenced consumer mind uh, mindset. And again, influencing and driving sales in certain product categories as well. Like, you know, Chloe, I'm sure has got a lot of experience in what's happening with, you know, active wear and, and lounge wear. And then again, just that repurpose, uh, purposing of dead stock fabrics as well. Um, so we know the impact or that that is having. Um, so I think I have, I have a stat on, I think it's costing, anyway, I will, I'll find that later. Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, there's a huge focus on sustainability. We're seeing triple digit increases in products using edited that mention words organic, recycled um, year over year. Um, so again, it's a really important focus that all brands and retailers need to be considering. Um, I did a podcast recently with um, the, a woman called Kelly Cortina, who's the, the VP of uh, Global Apparel at the North Face. And she was talking extensively about sustainability. So I'd really encourage everyone to, to listen to that. Um, but she was talking about how it's a really a combined effort between not just the brand and having to have all of that expertise in-house, but really partnering with your supplier base and the fact that everyone's in it together and how many minds brings some amazing creative ideas. And as a brand or as a retailer, definitely leverage that expertise and those relationships that you have with your supplier base. Um, and yeah, don't feel that you have to go it alone was, was kind of the message. Sounds like a great message. Chloe, did you want to add anything to that in terms of M Brown, how you work with your suppliers? Yeah, I think there's definitely like, there's been this year a lot more of like a mindfulness in terms of purchasing and in terms of, you know, buying to last, buying less and buy better. And there's lots of suppliers that we kind of work with to make sure that, you know, if there's, you know, VCI cotton, leather materials, you know, putting that extra quality in so people can invest into it. Um, there is that kind of work in terms of um, higher price points with that, which which comes across it. So I think that's definitely something that retail is navigating through at the moment. So there's definitely this want for sustainability, and that's definitely what retailers are chasing. Um, but then there's also that competitive market, which is very promo led and very kind of value based at the moment. So it's kind of like interesting to see how those two are coming together. And I think it's something that is still being navigated through across the industry. Yeah. And I think to, to Chloe's point, if I can jump in on that, it is a difficult challenge that brands and retailers have, right? That sustainable materials typically can cost more. So do you pass that cost on to the consumer or do you have to absorb that in-house? Um, but also knowing that there's that demand for discount messaging and people wanting to pay less. And I think that's where um, you should really leverage data and, and insights to understand what price points work and what customers are willing to pay for sustainable products. And maybe you can see shifts and opportunities in, in mixing up your assortment to maximize those opportunities. Yeah, and definitely. And to go back to the point that Fiona made before, it's all about that relationship you have with that supplier base. Um, there's been examples recently where we've had other retailers cancel out a fabric. Now that fabric goes to waste. Can we get in on that? Can we do something with that? Can we help out? And that'll be across the industry in terms of, where some retailers are pivoting away from certain things or kind of how you repurpose it. Did you originally buy it for a dress? Are you now going to make it into loungewear? It's just that kind of, I guess sometimes it's just thinking outside the box in terms of what can we do? What's the out of the possible? And speaking to your suppliers is almost, almost crucial sometimes in making that decision. I think with buying merch and just retail in general, it's all about throwing idea, ideas out there, bouncing them off each other and between you, you come up with something great. And I think that's super important in this industry. Yeah, 
I think as well, for, from a buying perspective, it's really important to keep up with the evolution of fabrics and what's actually happening because it's like it's changing and evolving so quickly. And a lot of the time, you know, your suppliers aren't aware of it, but you kind of have to say to them, oh, I saw, you know, this company is doing recycled polyester or, or you know, that there's recycled rubber in the market. Um, I'm kind of getting your suppliers into the mindset that the ones, you know, who keep on top of this are the ones that are going to, you know, are going to ultimately get the orders and become the bigger part of your business. So I think I think we can probably do a whole other webinar, can't we, on sustainability, <laughs> but I think what we've established is a collaborative approach is needed. And um, Grace, have you seen any um, reduction? Someone's just asking a question about, you know, the sort of longevity of a product, but actually more frequent newness and the sort of contradiction between that. Have you seen any, is there anybody doing less drops, buying less products from a sort of, you know, ASOS and people that, you know, are the, are the companies that are doing less drops at the moment? Yeah, I think ultimately that's a difficult question to answer considering coronavirus and the impact that there's been on the supply chain so I would hate to kind of make an assumption now that that's because of sustainability or whether that's because of of the supply chain and and obviously brands and retailers obviously having to adjust their plans and intake based on stores being closed and um, just consumer demand but I think it'll be really interesting as now stores have reopened um, and how that changes and whether we do see brands and retailers bring less to market um, as we kind of go back to whatever is the new normal. Yeah, I suppose it's a, as a period of adjustment, like you say. So definitely want to watch and perhaps a webinar for the future. Definitely, we could we could yeah. talk about it for a long time. And um, so just before we bring Tessa in to talk about tips of success buying, a, you know, a career in buying and merchandising, because we have had a couple of questions. And um, Fiona, just in terms of the future of your role, where do you see what, what do you see things going next in terms of the role of the buyer? Um, I think obviously the impact that COVID has had is, is something that in certain ways will, will remain. I think, um, I think understandably a lot of buyers will probably have to travel less now that companies have opened up to the fact that you know, we've managed to function for a year without, say, going on three or four long haul trips. Um, so you're saving on carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's definitely going to be something that remains. Um, I think the importance of being a being flexible as a buyer um, becomes even more and more relevant as the market evolves just in terms of technological advancements that you know that you can that you can shift from being a, a product development buyer to a branded buyer because as these marketplaces become a bigger and bigger and more important part of how um, smaller brands trade it's really important to be able to buy brands in addition to developing product. Um, I think there's going to be an emergence of smaller brands in general, and you can see that happening already in terms of like a lot of smaller um, brands popping up on Instagram. So I think there will probably, the buying role will maybe evolve and that it will, you know, there will be more roles in smaller companies. And I think these smaller companies will end up being the bigger companies of the future, given that there's such a big space being created from a lot of the big guys um, are obviously starting to sadly um, be less relevant now. Um, I think virtual will become obviously just a day-to-day -day part of the business as well now that we know we can do so much virtually. I think working um, as a general rule of thumb, working from home and, and having to go into the office, um, you know, less and less will just become the norm for buyers having to go in once or twice a week, I think. Um, obviously, as I said already, I think the importance of like line sheets and digital information um, going forward will become increasingly relevant. And um, I think moving closer to home in terms of our supply base is a goal probably for most buyers at the moment, trying to source um, products that are, that are closer to home. Um, obviously, there was such a massive shift in what happened a massive disruption to the supply chain at that point everybody started to try and, and think you know gosh for the we need to future proof now and make sure if this happens again that we that, that we're not so reliant um on on one or two countries so i think 
Um, I think the importance of resale as well, obviously, um, as Grace mentioned already, that's becoming increasingly relevant. And, and I think just um, how companies can adopt to that and how, like whether it's using dead stock and, and, and you know, finding, finding ways um, for big, big platforms to actually become more sustainable. Um, I think that's going to be increasingly relevant for buyers as well. Thanks, that's really insightful, Fiona. Uh, Chloe, in terms of the future of Merch then? Any, think, any thoughts? Yeah, I think obviously the, the landscape of retail at the moment is just ever changing. So I think definitely that flexibility and that kind of keeping up that pace, it's definitely been moved from kind of like a planning for a six months period to kind of like getting more and more often planning and that plan ever changing. Um, I think the role of merch and what will be the biggest impact over the next few years will be kind of like how we use AI and um, kind of like process automation or kind of use technology to drive decisions. So for example, one thing that M. Brown uses is kind of like um, an AI promo tool. So we can kind of make sure our, um, our promotions are the most profitable for us. I think another one is kind of um, stock management in terms of making sure we hold less at any one time. Um, how we can make sure we sell that through. Um, the market we're in at the moment is very promo driven and very discount driven. So kind of like what kind of Grace mentioned before, you know, like bringing it in, giving the, um, maybe not passing that cost on to the consumer, but we kind of recoup the, the benefit of that by not having so much dev stock at the end. So it's kind of, it really is about that analysis and just keep digging into what, what consumers want and kind of what's driving it. I think the next 12 months, who knows what's going to happen <laughs> um, in terms of are we still going to be at home in our PJs and our slippers or are we going to be going back out to weddings and whatnot? So I think a lot of it is very dictated at the moment in terms of circumstantial, in terms of what's happened in the world. But I think from a kind of like take that aside, it is very much that digital mindset and kind of how we use all of that data to drive the most profitable decisions. Fab, that's great. And so, um, sorry, we've got some really good questions. It's just um, managing to answer all those questions. So I hope we've given you a bit of a flavour there in terms of buying a merchandise. And so we didn't want to miss out um, hearing from Tessa regarding um, career advice and things like that. So Hi Tessa, I'll bring you in now. So um, we've got a couple of in. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions around qualifications and things like that. So would a would a course from the business of fashion or a short course be enough for a career in buying and merchandising? And then just any thoughts on tips for success, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it was interesting actually what I've what I'd heard from the from the webinar around kind of the attitudes and the behaviours that, that are needed for both buying and merchandising, because I absolutely agree with with what Fiona and Chloe and, and Grace have said around kind of what's needed in terms of, you know, traits or behaviours. Um, and absolutely, you know, the experiences, we can, you know, we can't argue that experience is invaluable. However, what I would always suggest from people is, you know, as Chloe mentioned, you know, her, her perhaps her degree was slightly different you know I, I came I did educational studies at university and wanted to be a teacher so it just shows that you can go down sort of different routes and um, I think absolutely if you've got the opportunity to do a, a short course um, in something that will tie into um, if you want to go into career buying merchandise and absolutely that's that's definitely very beneficial because you'll get some real experience in, in terms of what's expected um, but equally I think if you have come from a background that's perhaps slightly different it's about how can you gain that experience so doing that research um, perhaps you know like like at the moment quite a lot of free online courses that are available you know really researching and understanding what was that role involved maybe going on maybe watching some videos on um social media about a day in life of um but i think it's absolutely about skill set but i also think it's a lot a lot of a lot of it is about values and um about the behaviors um and attitudes and and like you said being, being able to have those transferable skills as well um so I really, I think my tips for success, if you were looking to go into buying merchandising in terms of, you know, what kind of we look for in terms of a talent acquisition perspective is really understanding, first of all, which it is you want to go into, because it'll be, we, it's amazing how many people um, that we get to apply, um, for example, within an environment round group, and I'm sure across all businesses where, um, especially perhaps for more of an entry level positions, um, will apply for both buying and merchandising. Obviously, they work very closely together, but there are some quite different, as we've discussed, there are some similarities and some major differences in terms of what is expected in, the, in terms of those roles. So 
I think it's important to understand what is it you want to go into, tailoring your CV towards that particular position, really thinking about almost creating a wish list of businesses you're quite keen to work for and doing your re research around them and then tailoring your CV around that as well. Um, so not just a not just a one fits all, not just a generic application, but really think about who you're applying for. Um, a lot of the a lot of the um, what we look for as well when we when we initially speak to somebody who's interested in working for the business is that kind of will in that enthusiasm, that understanding of of what they know about our company and um, the reasons why they've applied for that company in the first place. So. I think it's a combination of things. And I think it's about, um, like I said, having a bit of a plan in place, putting a bit of a wish list together, approaching it in the right way and having a clear understanding of what you want to go for and what you, an, an understanding of that role, that, you, that particular role and career path you want to go into. Um, of course, there's room for mistakes in, it, in all these processes. But I also would say as well, just as a little side note, is perhaps be a bit cheeky as well. You know, try and, you know, if you, if you're, there's a particular company you want to work for, um, then you know, find that person that works that business, and, and maybe have a maybe link in link in with them, and maybe send them a quick message, and um, saying I'm really interested in working for your organisation. At the at the moment, I think it's very difficult for people to gain experience in house, um, as the maps did before um, the, the pandemic, where you know perhaps going in for some free work experience or something like that would be really beneficial. It's a lot more difficult now. Um, but yeah, I think just being quite proactive and not giving up as well. I think it can probably can be quite disheartening when there's a lot of people applying for positions at the moment. But I'd say keep going. You know, I think um, if you do have an interview, for example, and you, you perhaps weren't successful, another tip for me would be to try and remember all the questions you were asked, write them down, practice the answers um, and, and kind of go back in for a second, your second kind of fight, I guess, for your, for your next steps. So there, there would be my tips of success. Yeah, Sarah, if somebody's already in industry then, so we've just got a question. Any any suggestions on how to really progress quickly in terms of moving your career on? Um, I think it would probably be a case of, I mean, depending on which business you work for, usually there'll be perhaps a development, perhaps a development, development plan in place. I think if you're trying to, I think if you're trying to um, perhaps move quickly in your career, I think it's about kind of setting those, setting, having those um making sure you're having regular catch-ups with your say line manager um i think discussing your um your, your development your perhaps your development needs or you know and being quite honest about where you want to be and you're kind of putting put a progression plan in place of course depending on which, which business you work for it might be a case of them being waiting for the opportunity to come up so you can go for it but i think just being quite honest about what you're looking for and what you hope to achieve and where you hope to go um, I think to move quickly, I think it will very, very much depend on perhaps with, with opportunities within that business you work for. But I think it's about, again, it's about having that right attitude and that kind of really clear um, path in place of where you would like to go and, 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 and perhaps putting a mini timescale in place for yourself as well of when you'd like to achieve that by. Yeah, I would, just to add to that as well, I'd say definitely kind of like look at that next person above you and what are they doing and what can you take on? or what can you kind of like mimic that they're doing and, and that's definitely the way that a lot of like the the people within businesses that I've worked at and even myself has always been like looking at what the people above you are doing and how can you in integrate that into your role and like Tessa said make it known it's a bit sometimes a bit kind of like you don't want to be known for that person who's always putting your hand up and kind of being like I'll do that I'll take that on but I think sometimes that's what gets you noticed and that's what gets you out there. And it might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but start getting used to feeling like that, I think. Yeah, and I, and I think there's, and then I think you could like close it, it might be reaching out to somebody who's maybe in a, a role um, that's slightly more uh, slightly more senior in your, in your position where you want to be next. And maybe, um, you know, having that honest conversation and saying, you know, would you mentor me? Can I learn from you? Um, you know, and like close it, what else do I need to do to get to the next step? Um, and just asking those questions. I think it is. It's just about it's just about talking to people and getting involved, isn't it? And um, just just really quickly, Tessa, any tips for Matt's questions for merchandise and interviews? Somebody's asking. They've been practicing ratios and percentages. Um, right. Is that enough? They're talking about graphs and to analyse, and they've struggled. What is it you're looking for when you when these dreaded maths tests of the merchandise and interviews? Can you give oh, us any insights? Chloe, you might best. I was going to say, do you want me to pick this one up? I would say. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that like graphs are, they're trying to tell you a story so I would try and see the story try and see the trends that it, it's giving you or that it's trying to make you pick out so when you're doing ratios and percentages it, it's very much a this is the right answer 
with graphs it's a lot more kind of like what is it showing like what look at your axes look at what it's trying to compare and what is the story that you're trying to take out of that so that's maybe I don't know if that's helpful or not but that's the way that we use them because we use a lot of graphs in terms of to show show data kind of what can you take away from that and look at it that way yeah okay lovely I think we're just about out of time somebody's asking about sad stepping from buying to sustainability roles I guess you could look at companies who are focused on that but I know certainly I've seen a lot more sustainability roles uh, advertised um, and I know for example you do an internship don't you Tessa for sustainability role and and they, do they come within sourcing and things like that and within those areas yeah absolutely yeah within the sort of, with our business it would tend to be sets within the sourcing teams so I think you probably got if you've done buying you probably got quite a lot of transferable skills you can you can um, you can get, go that way which which would be fab I'm sure so I think we're just about out of time so um thanks so much to Fiona Chloe Grace and Tessa um I hope you've enjoyed this um webinar um and just uh, thanks on behalf of the fashion network as well for hosting the webinar thanks thank you Lisa. thank you thanks. guys uh, really appreciate your time and um for all of those out there listening feel free to sign up to our platform to hear about the future professional development events so thanks lisa and thanks. the gang see you again soon thanks bye bye, bye.